Hello, I'm Michael Rickards, the Executive Director of the Hall Institute of Public Policy, and this is our public forum. Today, I'm pleased to have a friend of the Institute, a man who's given us some major work and who's known to many of you both through his writings and also through his public appearance with us in a previous forum, Mike Prezzuti. Michael, welcome. We're glad to have you back again. Good morning, Michael. Uh, you were such a smash success the last time. He's the president of Select Safety, very much involved in the whole question of training World Trade Center people in the whole areas of security. Uh, and he's an adjunct a faculty member at the university's med the medical school, uh, where he teaches mainly dealing uh, the questions of OSHA and dealing the question of school safety. Michael, welcome. We're glad to have you here today. It's a pleasure to be here, Mike. Good to see you again. We had you in part, Michael, because it seemed to me that it's important to really look at, in a different way, the anniversary, the terrible anniversary of 9-11, uh, the anniversary that has changed our country and that has shocked our country, that has made us reevaluate our basic liberties. And you're a man I know who feels very strongly about personal liberties in a political, philosophical sense. And so I thought you'd be a good person to, to explore the complexities because you know what the problems are that we're dealing with now in the United States. Give us a little idea, really, of from your perspective, what you thought about in the anniversary of 9-11. You know, I looked at... Uh you know, the opening of the memorial down at World Trade Center, uh, which, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an integral part of is, you know, with the, with the construction safety down there. I also had the opportunity to train the security staff that, that will man it. Um, the, it's an optimistic look um, at something going forward. Uh, it's a sp spectacular memorial, by the way. It's, it's grand. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful tribute uh, to 9-11. Um, philosophically, though, uh, f looking at, say, terrorism and how susceptible we are as a country, I look at the tremendous amount of security we have there, and, and that's wonderful, but my instincts tell me that from a terrorist perspective, the vulner vulnerabilities will not be there. Um, they will be in softer targets if there are targets at all. And I'm amazed sometimes when I look back at the 10 years and look at the lack of additional terrorist attacks. Uh, and I'm sure there are things that we don't know about, but um, that is either a testament to our government uh, and the people, our vigilance, or a testament perhaps to humanity and that, that people don't want to necessarily sacrifice their lives uh, to disrupt the lives of others and put it political agendas and religious agendas uh, to the forefront. When you train these people to be security agents for the World Trade Center or any other that you trade, what motivates people to get into the security business? Well, I do training in both safety and security. Um, I, I've had, you know, homeland security uh, training, you know, what New York City we call Local Law 26, which is a preparedness law. Uh, for major buildings, and uh, but but I had to do the uh, the uh, security staff down at the memorial, and I could tell you, rest assured, that that the folks that are doing that are incredibly trained. Um, they're trained because they most of them come out of either federal or city uh, law enforcement, so it's a very very strong um, uh, staff. The folks that go into that type of uh, endeavor, you know, security per se, are cut from another cloth. Uh, same thing with, along with firefighters, people who protect the public safety. Um, they have a, uh, a charge, if you will, that's more than just a professional charge, but it's personal. And, um, you know, they're not, they're willing, Michael, unlike many of us, to just lay everything they have, everything they'll ever own or have owned, um, right on the line for another fellow human being, which is incredible. Um, so I think the cloth that they're cut from is typically uh, different than, than the rest of us. Not to say that 
the rest of us wouldn't do that. I think that's a natural mechanism in humankind is to rescue, to help. Uh, but these people do it every day, and uh, that takes a special person. And they don't get paid very, very much as well. So, uh, is it they just want to be in an occupation that's exciting? The thrill of it, huh? I don't know. Um, I guess there are a percentage of those folks that are in it for the excitement. Um, I have a, a, a brother-in-law that's a firefighter, and I know that they get excited going out on runs, but yet they risk their lives as well. Which is the firehouse here in Manhattan where um, everybody in the firehouse perished in 9-11? Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure, Mike. There, but there is one that I, everybody I think there is perished a, Yes, I think there is one that left no one. Or at least that tour, you know, everyone was on that tour. Now, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious, why were the first responders not represented in mass at the 9-11 ceremonies? I was a little startled when I heard that. Uh, yeah, that, that, that had that wrinkled right on through um, New York City, actually, to firefighters and police officers that I spoke with, both on the Port Authority and New York City side. Um, you know, those decisions have to be made, obviously. Uh, perhaps it was, um, uh, you know, to, to limit the amount of people. Remember, it's still an active construction site, Mike. They're, they're, it's not as easy to move around in as you would expect, just thinking about it from, a, uh, you know, from the outside looking in. Uh, there, are, there are four towers being built and a, and a transportation hub being built yeah. and constructed right around the memorial. The memorial itself is surrounded by a 16-foot uh, chain, link chain, chain link fence that uh, you know, portions it off to the rest of the site. So I, I would imagine not knowing that logistics played a role in that decision, uh, that to have everyone there. It is incredible the amount of people and tourists to the site as well. Why... Uh on 9-11 at those ceremonies where there are no clergymen. I remember after 9-11, the churches and synagogues were packed. Michael, if I had organized it, I think I could answer that a little better. <laughs> um, the uh, I would probably have the same question. Perhaps it was a move to keep it away from, you know, the religious realm of, of what occurred. Um, it, perhaps the temper feelings that are still there. Um, it, that's beyond me. Sorry. Okay. Well, that was. Yeah, you can't hang me out on that. Uh, one, no, like, all right. <laughs> thought I had you. I thought I thought I had a uh, Ian Rand uh, person who wasn't going to give me the uh, usual uh, pro pro religious uh, view, but I figured I I just I, I figured I would try the second part of your of your. Um, a business uh, one deals with homeland security as we've come to quite hate that expression it sounds almost germanic it did when the i homeland. remember couldn't we come up with something better than that you know when it was national security michael or federal security federal security um, national would be a single government over like, a nation God, right yeah. it's, 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 the, it's, um, the third when i first heard it i thought the same thing it's right the homeland the was just called the right security yes the homeland security of the right protect the homeland but you've got a second piece of business um, which really involves much more dealing with more mundane things oh, that, that, that we're familiar with, OSHA, for example. Um, and what do you do in that in that uh, 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 set of services? Oh, you know, I'm an adjunct lecturer at, at UMDNJ, University of Medicine and Dentistry, the School of Public Health. And um, there, hey, look, we look at things from from a real perspective. If one is philosophical, what I write about, and you know those those passions I pursue. Um, the, the OSHA type training uh, gives me that, that edge on, 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 on the practical matters. And it's interesting that the CDC, NIOSH, which is the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, which comes out of the CDC, Center for Disease Control, um, has recently released some numbers uh, with a control group of firefighters that were not exposed to work at Ground Zero and those that were, and it's startling that it looks like there's going to be about a 19% increase of those people who are working down there. So um, if, if what we pursue in life is to help other people, um, what I do day to day, the mundane stuff, as you say, uh, perhaps can help people in other ways. So um, well, you have a personal antipathy, I guess it's a good word, towards big government, intrusive government, believing that it somehow 
uh, cuts the domain of personal liberty. And no one would deny that's not true. But OSHA, to many people, represents the most incredible manifestation of government authority and power, far more than the Social Security Act, far more than Obamacare. Do you agree with that? I don't at all. <laughs> of course not. I don't. Uh, as a matter of fact, OSHA is one of the smallest, it limited in its size. Um, you'd be fortunate or unfortunate to even see an OSHA in, in a compliance officer in New York City. Um, and although their regulations, their codes, are comprehensive across the board, um, I could draw a great argument why uh, OSHA or if something else were in its place, you know, something at a larger uh, scale would be necessary. Um, you know, as you know, the o OSHA Act of 1970, which President Nixon signed right, into law, right. uh, and with his sister, you know, EPA as well, uh, the, and 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 the and NIOSH, the comes about through the Constitution, which is uh, through the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, which basically says that interstate commerce, they, they the federal government, has the ability to regulate. And um, uh, OSHA is a, an incredibly uh, proactive, interactive federal agency. Uh, they are more about uh, trying to put people in compliance than they are to find someone um, they would sooner see someone just change the culture of their their organization their company as opposed to find them out of business and uh, so you do support parts of the nanny state then interesting how you want to put words in my mouth um of course i'm not for anarchy by any sense of, of the matter i'm for ordered liberty um in other words michael there has to be some way of controlling things without necessarily controlling everything. And I think it's just a matter of human nature that we push always to control others. And, you know, we often talk about left and right, but I believe there is no left and right. I believe there's a big, long circle. And that circle, if you push too far to the left, you'll go right, and you go too far to the right, you go left. Um, I think there's great evidence for that because it deals with cycles of human nature. And um, I think something that's uh, systemic in all things that we do, which is first principles, is the cycle, the matter of the cycle. Uh, you could look to science, you could look to uh, you know, or astrophysics, you can look to the, the Krebs cycle, the Calvin cycle, the, uh, you know, the cycle of life and death, uh, and you know our seasons, the solar cycles, the cycles are systemic to everything we do, and sociologically, economically, cycles exist. But the problem is we don't necessarily know that they exist when we're experiencing them. So we react because our lifespans are so short that some of these cycles go beyond our lifespan. And you get into a metaphysical um, uh, examination of that perhaps we're just in cycles and that it's necessary to have a so-called left and right because we actually work together to push one back to the other. That's so, why perhaps we have a two-party system as opposed so, to three. So you're going from Ayn Rand to Spengler? N no, cycles. no, no. Uh, cycles and Spengler's in fashion, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but remember, the, the Ayn Rand side of things, and uh, you know, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a, a disciple of, of some sort. So you, you try to cast me in these, uh, these discussions. But the if you want to use that term, uh, yeah, I would say cycles exist, but they have to be managed in a natural way. In other words, we have to allow things to happen necessarily, because we don't see what the where the cycle will trough or will will you know ebb and flow. So. If you're unaware of where that cycle is, and you have a ratchet effect, a ra um, excuse me, a um, uh, a, a knee-jerk reaction to it, not knowing where it's going or taking us, especially economically. Uh, in other words, if we're if we're in a recession, and I think you could look back on past interviews with me, and uh, you know you could see that I'm against when George W. Bush was was pushing money into this thing, um, and then Obama to follow. 
it, it wasn't good. And, and there's still money that's sitting around waiting and is so afraid because the inflation that could loom on the horizon could be terrific. Now, you uh, gave us a very fascinating piece a while ago. We published it. Um, it was a, a way to integrate construction jobs, uh, people who are out on parole, urban renewal. Okay, explain that a little bit. I don't want to... Michael, that, that was referred to as construction. Construction. And, and we have it, by the way, in our one of our volumes published by the Hall Institute as well as it was on our website. And there were two things that were so important to that. One is that they didn't use eminent domain uh, but we rehabilitated properties that were distressed using private money for reinvestment, using the most um, discouraged workers, which would be those people coming out of, uh, out of prison jails. Uh, at this point in time, Michael, there's so many people in the queue in front of those people that it's unfortunate to say, uh, but a program like that could never really work at this point in time. It can't work because of the high unemployment rate? Correct. Of people in the building unit, building Correct. trades? You could probably get private money to, if you had private money, you're going to employ people who could turn these things over faster. So what will happen? Those people go, who are ex-cons end up back in prison probably. Go back to prison. You see, again with the cycles, when we're doing well, when we're prosperous, we have to take care of those people who cannot take care of themselves and need that help. That goes back. To, so that You may say, well, that doesn't that sound like a nanny state, but it doesn't. It sounds like something economically where if you were running it as a business, you would say, look, we have excess resources. What do we do with that? We bring up the lower portions of our, our population at that point because we won't have that ability to do later when things get tight. Um, and by doing that, we will, of course, keep the cycles flatter. Um, you know, so you won't have as much misery uh, as things ebb and flow. Um, but we didn't do that. And we were certainly in the position to do that, say, a decade ago. Um, when we talk about 9-11, we talk about the terrorism that visited our country. We talk about our sensitivity and what Bush liked to call the war on terror. I don't know if it's a war. It was a series of skirmishes with ignorant foes. But when we talk about that, we do have to admit that to protect ourselves, we gave up some of our civil liberties. I can't get on a plane, for example, without them putting my body through an x-ray machine, have to take off my shoes, have to get rid of my water, stuff I never had to worry about before. And, I mean, more importantly um, than, than my inconvenience, extensive mo uh, monitoring of my telephone calls, say, to, to, the, to, to Europe, um, National Security Agency uh, connections, trying to find people. By doing that, uh, uh, have we in fact, uh, and, and by, by my being tacit, tacitly complicit in the creation of Guantanamo Bay and rendition, have the terrorists in a sense won some of those battles? Because in a free society, the only way we can battle Terra is to constrict, as we do in all wars, constrict civil liberties? Yeah, from that perspective, Michael, I believe you're right. Um, yeah, yes, they've won in that sense, that, that our, our, our liberties are less than they were. And they'll probably never return back. It work as a ratchet, of course. And as I've said, I think in interviews or perhaps in writing, that, that it, this, this works as a ratchet. And every little tick upward means there's a, a tick we can't get back and and that's that's not a good thing so yes they were successful in that and the exp and the money that we've put into it as well yeah, well the money's from I didn't remember, realize the remember money. Michael that that too is uh, you know if you give an example to local or 26 in New York City it, it's focused only on office buildings because that's where the terrorist attacks occurred um, if it were in movie theaters you know theater you know movie theaters uh, uh, you know, buses or something along another subways, we'd have an incredible amount of protection in, in there. So, it, it, again, this goes back to philosophical um, uh, issues. Um, what do we do? We put more guards at the gate, but, but terrorists won't use the gate to enter our fortress. 
um, you know, uh, Mao, guerrilla warfare. Uh, you you attack the arsenal of, of your enemy. You don't come full front at them because you don't have the you know the the manpower to do that. The soldiers to do it. So um, it, it's philosophical. We put our strength where we were attacked last. It's reactive. It's not proactive. And to be proactive is very difficult too because you're making a case and someone says, well, it never happened there. Why would we have to protect that? Um, and so then you, your default becomes that we should be always vigilant. Always vigilant. And what does that mean? Well, that, that means live your life <laughs> with your liberties. Uh, show this world that we live in that, that a culture that we've created is, is an ideal culture to live in. And I don't necessarily mean in excesses and things that we perhaps do that, you know, look like, you know, we're a, a me generation, but, but the freedom, the liberty, the economic freedom uh, to choose. Um, that's the part that you have to be vigilant about. If you let go of those things, they're gone forever, or perhaps not forever, but they lend themselves to a revolution down the road at some point where the ratchet breaks instead of stop, you know, stops ticking, which we have seen. And uh, I think the, the, the scariest thing to me is that most Americans think that it will always be America and that we're always protected. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think that uh, we see countries fall economically. We see Greece and, and the straits that they're in. We've seen the Soviet Union fall. Uh, China is sometimes looked at uh, economically, and we have to scratch your head. It's a mixed system with tremendous civil rights issues, tremendous lack of freedom in, in many quarters of it, yet economically it's humming along through a centralized mechanism that seems to, you know, they're you know, f floating their currency, holding their currency. Um, issues of public health are always the cases, lead and paint and... Uh, you know, talk about OSHA <laughs> into China. Those issues are always going to be there, and who knows where that... Can the American Republic survive, the American Empire? If our ideals survive. And I think our ideals are inherent in human nature, so yes. Frequently, you hear the mayor or the governors say, you must be, you, the individual citizen, must be vigilant. If you see something that looks suspicious, if a guy leaves a backpack on the subway, keep an eye. I used to live in Washington, D.C. And if you see somebody suspicious, they would say, report it to this number. Well, I used to get off at DuPont Circle. I mean, I would be spending my entire day calling the police department about people I thought were particularly weird. But in there is a theater in Union Station. It used to be, not anymore. It used to be eight theaters. And right after we had a very bad terrorist incident, they, they said, be careful, watch out what was going on. So I'm bringing my wife there, we're watching a movie. Guy comes in before the movie, leaves his backpack and walks out. And I went, so I went over to the, to, the, uh, to, to, to the head of the theater and he was very nervous. Came in and in walks the guy about 10 minutes later what a gigantic popcorn thing. So I was like, kind of like, I was kind of an idiot. I could have had this guy. Yeah, I think. I, I Is think that what's wrong with self be, be, being careful? I mean, on the on the subway, how many people on the I just took the subway up here. Okay, okay. How many people look extremely strange on that subway? Maybe I look strange, but how many looked extremely strange? How many were carrying things that you wonder what was in there? The, the interesting is, part is, of... Is, is yeah. self-policing... Now, you do this for a living. You the, train real real police. The, is self-policing really just an illusion? There is some part of it that... Yeah, Michael, there is, there is some part of it that just says that a police presence can be um, self-regulating. The um, And to the subways, you'll be surprised to know um, how many people, how many undercover New York City police officers are actually in the subways and you could not pick them out. Um, I, I take the subways all the time. It's the only way I travel in Manhattan. Can you pick them out? And uh, No, I can't, but I've been on an occasion where um, there was an incident on a subway and lo and behold, two, two police officers, undercover oh, really? police officers popped up and I would have never guessed who they were. Um, one was a female officer who she looked, she had shopping bags and the whole... It was interesting. Um, but with, with that said, we become complacent. 
Um, that's one of the perils of success and the perils of, of basically living in a republic in, in that we, if we enjoy our freedoms and liberties, we tend to forget and, and, and we tend not to appreciate them. Once we stray from appreciating what we have, we slip into complacency and that's when we become weak. You um, are. You have a, an extraordinary uh, uh, background. You're a, a man of action, obviously. You use Woodrow Wilson's dichotomies. You're a man of action, also a man of thought. You're a man of action because you train people who really are on the front, front lines of some of the most terrible uh, pieces of activity and peril that we face. Uh, but you're also a person who loves ideas. And you gave a lecture not too long ago uh, on the Secretary of Treasury, uh, a man named Gallatin, who was Jefferson's uh, treasurer, tre Secretary of Treasury. And of course, you're knowledgeable about the, the first great Secretary of Treasury, which is Alexander Hamilton. Uh, who created the bank of the the bank of um, the United States you know, bank of the United States and created all the, uh, the tariffs and everything? Yeah, he else. was the f responsible for the first bank. Uh, you know, or you know, the, the, the what would be the Fed? There are so many wonderful issues to look at with with so Hamilton. So you're going to look at both of these people together. I'm, I'm currently doing that now. Um, uh, it, it, Alex and, and Albert. Um, as I like to call the two of them, uh, the uh, first Treasury Secretary and the fourth Treasury Secretary, Albert Gallatin, of course. Now, again, think about this in, in the cycles and see if this makes some metaphysical sense to you. Um, Alexander Hamilton, as you said, the first great Treasury Secretary. And by the way, re remember, at the Treasury Building in D.C., they flank the entrances. Right. Uh, there's right. a statue of Al Albert Gallatin and a right. statue of, of uh, Alex Alexander Hamilton. Of course, no one knows Al Albert Gallatin. That's the problem. But but all the um, the debt that Alexander right. Hamilton right. created, uh, with taking the, the the you know the military pays from the states back into the you know the national federal government, um, and all the excise taxes that he created as well. Under, of course, George Washington as president. That's right. Uh, Albert Gallatin paid down by taking away the excise taxes, allowing the economy to move, and hence we had the credit to fight the War of 1812, which, of course, was the second revolution, uh, you know, of independence, you know, breaking away from England. And so if it wasn't for Gallatin on the flip side of, of, of debt, meaning creating credit by paying it back and increasing the credit worthiness of a, of a fledgling, a fledgling uh, uh, you know, country, there would be perhaps no United States. Um, and we're talking, we're talking about a man of action, an incredible life Gallatin led, uh, founder of NYU, so anybody who is um, a New York City resident should know uh, right. Albert Gallatin's roots, and of course they're both buried at Trinity Church. Oh, they both buried. I didn't know that. That is incredible. Yeah, well, you wouldn't know that, Michael. That's the problem when you do the tour up to a few years ago, at least until some no. until somebody went to Federal Hall and said to some of the uh, park rangers, "Hey, do you know who Albert Gallatin is?" And is that uh, you? And you got that a you went. <laughs> who else has? I time? did. I, <laughs> why not? Why not ask? The, and the, those those folks are great. Um, but the 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 tour never talked about Albert Gallatin, and now Albert Gallatin is talked about, and um, it's incredible. So think about this, um, as statues at the, the Department of Tre you know, Treasury Department, Gallatin, Hamilton, Trinity Church. This is by no coincidence, no one planned this, Michael, it's incredible. Trinity Church, the South Yard, the Old Yard has Alexander Hamilton, the North Yard has Albert Gallatin. Um, when you look at them phil philosophically, they're part of one coin, but they're on both the, either side of the coin, you know, philosophically as, as far as economics go. Um, the, the, their juxtapositions are incredible, and I'll make a case, I believe, that their juxtapositions are actually one, um, and that the, the time, the history that's transpired has made them one. So in other words, that's a classic example of what I'm saying, is that when things are occurring, they may seem like there are two poles, yet as time goes by, you'll see that those two poles were actually one, necessary for one another, supplementing one another, but at the time they would have been, and they were, by the way, 
uh, diametrically opposed to one another. You know, Gallatin was, and I don't like to even use this term, uh, it was coined by another uh, a historian, a, a gatfly, and Albert Gallatin would not have been a gatfly. Okay, that, 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 that this is a great man in, in himself. Uh, gatfly seems to say something popping around or bugging Alexander Hamilton. Not the case at all. This is a huge man himself, not, not in stature, of course, everyone was a lot smaller, uh, but, but a huge man in thought. When is your dual biography coming out? I'm, I'm still at it right now, Michael, as, as they when go. When it comes out, I promise you, the, the whole institute will review it. I, well, I, I'll appreciate we, we, that. We'll, we'll put it right on our website it, as the lead article. It's a, it's a work in progress, and I'm inspired by it every day. So, uh, um, Thank you very much. Our guest today was Mike Prezzuti, a man of action, a man of thought, and a man very much involved in the whole question of internal security and homeland security. Michael, thank you, and also thank you for your contribution to making this country a little bit safer. Good day.